Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and a few shows about the Pacific campaign and today I'm delighted to bring back a guest for his third visit. Jeffrey Cox was on twice memorably before. He's on to talk about the events of his latest book which I have a copy of and he doesn't because of how publishers work which is there, Dark Waters Starry Skies. You can find the link to purchase the book in the description below or you can buy it at a bookshop of your choice. I will just remind you because I'm wearing one today there is World War II TV merchandise. If you'd like a hoodie like this with I, si I joined up with World War II TV. The links are in the description below, and you can look just as smart as I as I do, although I don't offer the hats, but that's another subject for the day. But I'm going to bring in Jeffrey now. Uh, thanks, everybody, for attending. It, here's Jeff. So good afternoon, Jeff. How are you today? Uh, same as always. Good, good. So we were just talking before going live there. You know, your, your original intention when you looked at the, the Guadalcanal and the Solomon Islands was to kind of cover it all in one book, and here we are three or four books later, it is, it's one of those subjects that on the surface, it's, it's, it's one size. And then when you get into the weeds, there's more and more and more you can, you can untangle with it. So it's, it's obviously something you're really interested in. So why do you think we should be talking more about this campaign is my first question before we bring up the PowerPoint. Well, I, I would say that the Guadalcanal Solomon's campaign, and it really should be discussed as one campaign, mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of the drama was in Guadalcanal, but uh, the Guadalcanal part of the campaign, and that's what gets the most attention. But you really see the progress of the U.S. military and especially the U.S. Navy uh, upstream of that as they go up the, the Solomon Islands chain, especially what we learned in terms of amphibious uh, warfare and uh, what we didn't learn about amphibious mm -hmm. warfare and uh, what we learned and did not learn uh, about night fighting. And uh, we had several naval battles, uh, which were quite interesting in the middle and upper Solomons, uh, that were, we tried to put together some of the lessons of the Guadalcanal campaign, but we had to toss in some new admirals uh, who had not had the experience of the campaign. And we had some, what I would call doctrinaire issues, uh, where the US Navy was really gun centric and they, they had trouble accepting that if you want to sink a ship, you have to put a hole in the hull beneath the waterline. And the best way to do that is with a torpedo. Uh, and they had a lot of trouble with that. Uh, they had been so focused on guns. They had largely ignored torpedoes uh, to the detriment of the torpedoes uh, in, in part because they couldn't test it properly because of budget cuts. But it, it seemed like they didn't care because they were so wedded to the big guns, they took the torpedoes off the warships, uh, which left the cruisers uh, out to dry when they had to face the Japanese battleships off Guadalcanal. And uh, there, there was a definite rigidity, even in the, the battlefield commanders who developed during the war, who were good on a battlefield, but they had come up in that system of rigidity and were not able to think outside of that box until you had people come up like Arlie Burke, uh, who was uh, who's mentioned in this next book a couple times, uh, and uh, Admiral uh, Merrill, who were able to look at these earlier battles and draw some conclusions from it that they were able to put to good use. They didn't feel restricted by these boxes. They, they were looking for creative solutions, just like General Kenny was uh, with the uh, Fifth Air Force in Australia. Well, brilliant. Well, we love the idea of creative solutions, and I've discussed it with other with other authors and historians. In in fact, some ways, writing about the middle part of the war when the Allies are still learning the game and learning the ropes is, in some ways, more interesting than writing about the end of the war when actually things are starting to get a little bit more organised and the doctrine and the methods are are perhaps a little bit more sordid. So that middle period is really fascinating. But as Always, you've come out armed with a PowerPoint, which will take us to. So, folks, we're going to sit back and listen to Jeffrey now. And as you know, if you've watched him before, it'll be full of passion, full of uh, full of um, exclamations and voices, if we're lucky. So, folks, fire away with your questions. But I think we'll probably do the big ones at the end of the presentation. But I'm going to hand over to Jeff now to take us through the events of, of the Solomon Islands uh, 80 years ago. So over to you, Jeff. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my next book, Dark Water Starry Skies, is uh, going to be the third book of what has become the uh, Guadalcanal Solomon's Campaign Quadrilogy. And this one, this book deals uh, specifically with uh, the uh, shoot down of Admiral Yamamoto uh, and uh, the New Georgia campaign, uh, which was part of the uh, 
post Guadalcanal campaign. It was uh, New Georgia started in uh, late June of uh, 1943 under some uh, rather interesting circumstances. And as I understand it, your theme this week uh, deals with Coast Watchers. We're doing that. Yep. Yeah. And uh, and this is a general map of the South Pacific in 1943. And as far as I know, those islands are still in roughly the same positions. Uh, and this is the Solomon Islands and the Bismarcks. Uh, and again, they're still roughly in the same positions. But when you talk about Coast Watchers, uh, just to go into a little bit of background on them, uh, they were part of a program uh, started by a, a man named Eric Felt. And uh, when he saw war was coming to the Pacific, he started organizing a lot of the government officials and uh, plantation owners and uh, other, other you know, high-ranking people in the British Solomon Islands Protectorate and in Papua New Guinea and started organizing them for purposes of keeping an eye and ears and, if, if necessary, nose and taste buds on the enemy. And uh, he named it uh, Ferdinand after a uh, particular children's story uh, called Ferdinand the Bull, uh, where the bull preferred to sniff flowers to bullfighting, uh, much to the consternation of the crowds in the Spanish arenas. And if you've heard me uh, discuss on the uh, my the, my earlier books of this campaign, I've said repeatedly ad infinitum that the two most important parts of any military campaign are information and communications. Now, don't get me wrong; they're not the only important parts of the campaign but I would hold that they are the most important parts and they are intertwined because information has no value if you can't get it to the people who can use it. And communications has no value if you have nothing important to say. And this Ferdinand program uh, addressed actually both of those issues because it seeded uh, the Solomon Islands, especially, but also Papua New Guinea and uh, the Bismarck Archipelago with these members of the Ferdinand program uh, who became known as Coast Watchers because they would watch the coast and they would see, oh, Japanese ships are passing by. Maybe I should report this in. Oh, Japanese aircraft are overhead. Maybe I should report this in. And they were given radios and uh, they were hidden uh, in, in the bush as best as they could. And this uh, this map that I have uh, prepared for you, it lists some of the more famous uh, coast watchers that have been mentioned uh, in a lot of the history so far. If you start off to the lower right, you have uh, Martin Clemens, uh, who most famously started the Guadalcanal campaign <clears throat> by reporting uh, to the Allies that the Japanese were building an air base on Guadalcanal. And uh, he would not want to be mentioned without mentioning his chief scout, Jacob Vuza, who uh, he was uh, captured by the Japanese on the eve of their attack on uh, Henderson Field along uh, the Elu River and tortured for information. They cut him, they cut him up with knives pretty, pretty badly and they left him tied to a post to bleed to death. Well, he didn't bleed to death. He crawled back to the Henderson Field perimeter and warned the Americans uh, the U.S. Marines, that the Japanese were coming and gave them some information on what they were going to face. Jacob Uza uh, and Martin Clemens would not let Jacob Uza uh, do anything more without going to the doctor and being treated for his wounds. And Uza eventually returned to service and he gave such brilliant service that he was knighted by the British government. So uh, that's partly where the fame of the Coast Watchers sort of started with that and they made themselves very useful with the start of the Guadalcanal campaign. But if you go to the Northwest up the Solomon Islands chain, like we'll start uh, on New Georgia uh, near Seggy Point at the Southeastern portion of it, you had a, a plantation owner named Donald Kennedy. He was another coast watcher and uh, he would keep an eye on the, the, the New Georgia area. And it was a fairly big archipelago. <clears throat> 
uh, for the Allies. He seems to have been a bit of a character as a plantation owner. He was at one point shot by his own men. Uh, which was a bit of a rarity in World War II. It's less rare these days, uh, especially if you're in the Russian army in Ukraine. Uh, and as you continue going uh, northwest, you get to the island of Kolombangara, uh, where there is a big volcano. And uh, on the slopes of that volcano was uh, a coast watcher named Reginald Evans. And Reginald Evans became uh, famous for two things, one slightly more famous than the other. Uh, one was he was awakened by Japanese destroyers uh, coming by in the middle of the night once. And he was annoyed by this. He reported it in, went back to sleep, woke up the next morning and found those destroyers disabled by the mines the Americans had placed in the strait. And so he radioed that in and those destroyers were promptly sunk by uh, air attacks. But also with his chief scouts, uh, Byukugasa and Aroni Kumana, uh, they helped rescue the crew of one PT boat numbered 109, which was commanded by uh, John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And uh, they, uh, the, the chief scouts found him. He, he had sent them out and they sort of exchanged messages using coconuts between them. And eventually they were able to get him and the survivors of his PT boat, which was run over by the destroyer Amagiri, uh, back to uh, Allied lines. And he was able to uh, uh, return to service. And uh, hopefully, I, I, I hope he was able to make something of his life. Uh, if you continue going to the Northwest on the island of Villa Lavella, you would have uh, Henry Jocelyn, uh, who was really the big coast watcher there. He worked in the Northwest and uh, a reverend, a Methodist minister uh, known as A.W.E. Sylvester. He worked in the Southeast. Uh, that Methodist minister, that religious issue would um, play some role later on. I'm not quite sure how much the Japanese knew about him, but Henry Jocelyn played a big role in the rescue of about 160 survivors of the cruiser Helena, who had drifted to the coast of Vela La Vela after their ship was sunk at the Battle of Kula Gulf, or the second Battle of Kula Gulf, or the first Battle of Kula, depending on how you number it. Uh, to the north of that on Choi Seal, you had Nick Waddell, uh, who was able to report some of the Japanese movement of barges uh, both to reinforce uh, the New Georgia area and to withdraw from it. On Bougainville, continuing up to the northwest, uh, over the shortlands area and the big Japanese air base at Bouin, you had Paul Mason, uh, not to be confused with the French vintner, Paul Masson. He was very frequently involved in reporting Japanese activities, such as ships leaving the area, uh, the big anchorage in the shortlands, and uh, activity at the Bowen Air Base. And uh, finally, at the far northwestern end of Bougainville, the Big Island, you had Jack Reed. And he was on a big hill overlooking the island of Buga, where the Japanese initially had built an, uh, taken over an emergency airstrip. And then they built another airstrip on the mainland called Bonas. And so he was able to keep sort of an eye on those he and Mason eventually got squeezed by the Japanese a bit on Bougainville uh, by uh, them turning the native Melanesians against them. These people, these coast watchers, they were very dependent on the goodwill of the native Melanesians uh, to protect them. Because the Japanese, uh, very early in the Guadalcanal campaign, became aware of the activities of these coast watchers. And uh, they sent out squads to find them and to kill them. And these Coast Watchers that I've, I've listed here, these are only the most famous. This organization had hundreds and hundreds of people in it. And it, it was the Coast Watchers. They also had bodyguards. They also had supplies and uh, scouts, lots of scouts reporting in. And this was a huge organization. And it was a, a brilliant idea. And early on, the Japanese learned if you consider the Guadalcanal campaign, if the Japanese were launching an attack, an air attack from Rabul, 
you go down to the southeast. You, you pass over Jack Reed, Paul Mason, Nick Waddell, Henry Jocelyn, Reg Evans, Donald Kennedy, and then you get to Guadalcanal. It's almost like a gauntlet passing air over any number of these. It's like tripwires. Passing over any number of these can warn the Americans and uh, warn the, the Kiwis and Australians or wherever else were at uh, Henderson Field that the Japanese were coming. Same thing with ships. So the Japanese took uh, punitive measures to try to get rid of them on the various islands. Sometimes they were successful as ultimately they were in Bougainville. Uh, but Jack Reed and Paul Mason and their uh, helpers were withdrawn before that came to fruition. The other thing the Japanese were compelled to do was fly around the Solomons and send the ships around the Solomons, not through them, not through what they called the Guadal Highway, what we call the slot. Uh, they would send them to the north or to the south to try to avoid tipping off the coast watchers. And the Japanese got very, very, very frustrated with their inability to get rid of the coast watchers, their inability to deal with the coast watchers. So they had a major, major role in the Guadalcanal campaign and really the entire Solomon's campaign going forward. And it got almost to be something psychological with the Japanese. And it sort of started to underskirt a lot of the things they did and affected the, the way they behaved in something of an irrational fashion. And that's something that I start start the book out with because start out on dark water stars skies with because the Japanese uh, in March 1943, uh, the beginning of March 1943, they suffered the loss of the lay convoy, the convoy of a Japanese division from the Imperial Army that was to be sent to lay. They were all destroyed in what was called the Battle of the Bismarck Sea, even though it wasn't really in the Bismarck Sea. And uh, that was a profound psychological effect on the Japanese because they realized they couldn't move large transports under contested skies anymore. So they were losing their air power as they had had ever since Pearl Harbor, at least. But also, they really started noticing at that point that wherever they moved a ship, wherever they moved a convoy, they seemed to run over a submarine or get targeted by an air attack. And they were wondering, how is this possible? Now, we know today that that was because of uh, what we would call magic, because we had broken the Japanese codes. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Japanese never really considered that possibility. And in uh, WIWAC of uh, Central New Guinea, uh, they had the solution to what was causing all of these problems. Catholic missionaries. Yes, this was all the fault of Catholic missionaries. In central New Guinea, there was uh, a remnant of the German colonization of New Guinea back in the late 19th century. Uh, the Society for the Divine Word had established uh, several missions, and uh, one of them, a big one, was in Wewak in central New Guinea uh, on the north coast. And they established a major presence there. And uh, they were headed by, uh, at, during this time period, uh, Bishop Josef Lux. He was a bishop, even though he was like a vic vicar at that point, but it, his title was bishop. And he had sort of come up through the system in New Guinea with the Society for the Divine Word. He had worked his way up through that system. And so he knew what all the volunteers went through. He knew what the missionaries went through. And although he was a bishop, he had the robes, he had the big pointy hat, uh, he, that's called a mitre. He would be working in his, in short sleeves. He'd be working in shorts to try to get a lot of the stuff done that, that the church needed. And, and uh, he was called the fighting bishop because he was charismatic and not easily intimidated. And uh, after Guadalcanal, the Japanese showed up at Wewak. They were retrenching in the South Pacific. And so they were started to assemble uh, 
a major military staging area at WIWAC, and they did not like these Catholic missionaries being there. Now, this was a little bit strange because most of these missionaries were Germans, and Germany was ostensibly an ally of Imperial Japan at this point. But, you know, while Hitler and Himmler were raised Catholic, their adherence to Catholic teachings could, well, let's just say it left room for improvement, to, to put it mildly. And uh, they, at best, didn't care about their Catholic missionaries, their Catholic citizens on the other side of the world, not when they had a special barracks at Dachau for Catholic priests. So they didn't care. The Vatican was officially neutral. It couldn't do anything. So uh, the Japanese started harassing these people. And as in any, any totalitarian state, they were paranoid. They imagined everyone was spying on them. And the fact that these were Germans uh, suggests that there was definitely a racial element to it. They did not like Europeans in any of the areas in which they claimed an interest. And so they took to harassing these Catholic missionaries and uh, threatening them. They did straight up murder them, several of them. And uh, they thought these missionaries were coast watchers. They accused one of them of having, of, you know, sending messages on what was really a typewriter. He was just typing information up. They thought these Catholic priests were actually sending information to the allies at mass. They seriously thought this. I guess maybe they were transmitting these convoy information in Latin, or they were sending up smoke signals with incense, or they were passing information along in Gregorian chants. I don't know how they could have possibly thought this. It was preposterous, but this is what uh, totalitarian societies do, and, to and totalitarian racist societies especially. And ultimately, they restricted the uh, Society for the Divine Word missionaries to their uh, headquarters on the island of Kariru, uh, a place called St. John. Well, number one, there wasn't enough food there. But then the Japanese decided they wanted to build a major base there. And things were not helped when a Japanese destroyer was torpedoed by a submarine in the harbor at Weewak. And Bishop Lurks was seen watching it because he was a sailor. He had he loved ships and he had one of his own when he was working his way up through the ranks of the uh, Society for the Divine Word. And they said he had passed this information along. And things got even worse when an Allied bomber, a U.S. bomber on a scout mission was shot down in the sea off of Weewak. And the head of the air crew tried to contact the missionaries at St. John asking for help in trying to get back to allied lines. And, you know, not all of the natives were uh, with the allied at this point. And some of them passed it on to the Japanese. And so for all those reasons, the Japanese decided that, hey, we're going to move these people. And if they're building a base there, that's sort of understandable. The abuse was not. And so they decided to send the destroyer Akakazi to take the Catholic missionaries of the Divine Word and uh, some of their lay people and some other uh, civilians to uh, Rabul, where they were going to be put in a uh, an internment camp. And the Akakazi left on March 15th. It headed to Manus in the Admiralty Islands, where it picked up more Catholic missionaries and some Lutheran missionaries too. And then it went to uh, Kavian, which, as you can see on the uh, map, is in the far upper left corner. That's on New Ireland, major Japanese base there. It went there, but it just stopped. It didn't go into the harbor and take on any supplies and take on any fuel or anything. Just a guy came out in a boat, handed a sealed envelope for the captain. And uh, so the captain read it. And then he told the senior officers that, these were orders from the 8th Fleet to kill all these Catholic missionaries and dump their bodies overboard. So that's what he did. He said he didn't have a choice. And uh, no one's really disputing even 
that he was given these orders, but they did kill uh, the, the X marked on the map while they were going between Kavian and Rabul. They were uh, one by one, they were shot at the stern area of the ship and the bodies tossed overboard, except for two toddlers. The Japanese couldn't bring themselves to actually shoot the toddlers. So they gave each of them a banana and then tossed them overboard. So much more civilized. And to this day, uh, no one can really figure out what happened. Uh, the most of the, the participants in the uh, actual massacre died during the war. Uh, the commanders, you can say they're responsible for it legitimately, but the character of the commanders indicates that that's, that's not something they do. They wouldn't normally order war crimes. It's just not what they what these particular people did. So there's there seems to have been a break in the instance, and it seems to have been like an overzealous member of, of the uh, the staff of the Eighth Fleet who was sort of bullied into it by the commander in Weewak. At least that's my take on what happened, but what really happened would never be known. Uh, but the Society for the Divine War did investigate it there after the war, and they did really good work with it. But it, this is generally not well known because there was no one to prosecute it after the war because these, these were German citizens. Mm. And well, Germany wasn't in a position to do anything about it after the war. Nobody else cared. Even though there were two Americans, the Americans took it and they just sort of ignored it after that. So uh, this really has not gotten a lot of attention, but it started not just because of the, the inherent racism and the Meiji restoration and everything after that in Japan, but because they thought they were coast watchers. The Japanese thought these were coast watchers. They thought they were transmitting this information to the Allies. They couldn't figure out how they were doing it since they couldn't find a radio anywhere. They couldn't find anything, any means of transmission, but they still thought it. So mm -hmm. uh, the Coast Watchers were really getting into the Japanese psyche at this point. They were blaming everything on the Coast Watchers. And uh, then something like this, it was pretty irrational. At least that's that's what I would argue. We had a question earlier, Jeff, about whether or not the Japanese were using any kind of RDF radar direction finding to, to locate coast watchers, or was it more kind of rumor and, and local, you know, as you said, they're suspecting locals they were aware of. They had some uh, radio direction finding equipment. It was mostly limited to Japan itself. Um, they had some in the outlying bases, uh, interestingly, in the uh, Solomon's campaign, in the New Georgia campaign, uh, the Japanese ships not only started appearing with radar, but with radar detectors. Right. So uh, they were able to pick up some of this this radar stuff, maybe not get the, the right direction necessarily, uh, but they were able to make some judgments from it. The, the, they had this, some of this equipment, but it wasn't as good as the Americans, and they didn't have as much of it. We had made a major investment in uh, uh, Station Hypo at Pearl Harbor. We it, Ultimately, we had hundreds of people working in there, and we had radar sets in Melbourne. We had uh, Pearl Harbor. We had you know, lots of places. The Japanese one uh, was much smaller. They did not put nearly the amount of effort into it. Uh, so... Some of it was radio, radio direction finder. Some of it was just intercepting the radio calls. They could tell what was being sent, even if they didn't know what the actual information was. But if they didn't see like a ship or a plane nearby, well, it had to be one of those ghost watchers. So it wasn't that hard. But trying to crack the Melanesian natives, that was a lot more difficult. And they were only ultimately able to do it on Bougainville, uh, although... Uh, as you know, I explained earlier, they did have some effect in the WeWAC area. Yeah. But the in the uh, the presence of the Coast Watchers in the Japanese psyche was a bit useful for the U.S. at times, uh, not just because of the information the Coast Watchers provided, but because it gave us an excuse. Uh, and that came to the forefront in uh, April of 1943, where motivated in large part by the uh, Battle of the Bismarck Sea, uh, 
the Japanese decided that they needed to mount a counterattack uh, against the allies in the South Pacific so that they could buy time to firm up their defenses. And what better way to mount that counterattack than with the flyers of the Japanese carrier striking force, Kido Butai. They wouldn't send the carriers themselves down there that they were too valuable. They just sent the pilots and the planes. And this was so important that Admiral Yamamoto himself decided to go. And uh, he, for the first time ever, he established the headquarters of the combined fleet ashore. And the Japanese in Rabul knew it was getting real when they saw the staff members pulling out the fine china. That's when you know things are getting really serious. And when Yamamoto uh, got to Rabul, if you, you take a little bit of a look at the uh, photo in the lower right, he's the figure in the white towards the back of that photo. In the middle of that photo next to him is Admiral Kasaka, who headed base Air Force. And Yamamoto, it always struck me in that photo, Yamamoto looked very frail. He looked sick. And apparently he was suffering from uh, some form of maybe beri berry or that their thing, because he was changing his shoes five times a day. He wasn't displaying the best judgment. And he didn't want to do this operation, but he didn't really have much of a choice because the emperor wanted it. So uh, came down and they did... Uh, more it says more than a week of air operations but really it was just like four days of operations because there were a lot of uh weather uh interfering with it like uh, they attacked Guadalcanal in the attack x they call it on april 7th and uh then they had x2 going after uh the uh, buna area on april 11th uh, they went after Port Moresby on the 12th, and then they went after Milne Bay on the 14th. And the Japanese thought that they, they reported that they sank approximately 15 aircraft carriers, 30 battleships, uh, 51 cruisers, 1,411 destroyers, and approximately 10,000 aircraft, or something like that. They always overreported the damage they committed, and the, their superiors were you know, bound to believe it. Uh, in reality, they had done, they had like lost 55 aircraft to uh, costing the Allies maybe 25 aircraft and they sank maybe two ships, the whole thing. It wasn't disproportionate. They did not get value for their commitment and these were highly trained carrier pilots. Yamamoto was really not happy about it. And uh, one at the top is one of the last photos taken of him. Uh, but he wanted to cheer up his troops, so he decided that he was going to fly to the base at Buin and cheer them up. And the Japanese decided, instead of sending it by courier, which Yamamoto staff officer wanted to do, they would send it by code, because the Americans could never break this code, and they could never understand Japanese anyway. They're, they're just not sophisticated enough. Well, yeah, the Americans had it within the hour and they were figuring a way to intercept it. And everyone knows, you know, everyone who's watching this show knows the story. Yep. Uh, or, yeah, they flew over water. And this was actually a mirror of what the Japanese were doing to attack Guadalcanal going around the Solomon Islands so they wouldn't attract anybody. And uh, they made the intercept. Uh, off Bougainville and uh, and uh, that had a that started a controversy uh, that continued to this day over who actually shot down Yamamoto although I think it's been pretty much established that it was uh, he was shot down by uh, Lieutenant Rex Barber and uh, uh, it was the only one person thought that maybe the Americans had broken their code and he was one of the, the uh, zero pilots who had not protected Yamamoto. So nobody cared what he thought. He was never debriefed. And the Japanese went on thinking, ah, now, wonder what it was. And publicly, we blamed, we said it, we got information from Coast Watchers that led us to be able to shoot down Yamamoto. That's what we said publicly. 
Now that's pretty ridiculous on its face. But that's what we said. And the Japanese didn't question it. They never, they never thought that we uh, had broken their code. So the, the Coast Watchers were a convenient a, a tool for assigning blame, if you want to call it that. For the uh, and just to clarify that, because uh, Philip is asking, um, although you're going to clear it up, the recollection is the Japanese did not get paranoid after Emamoto's death. I mean, they, they attributed, as you said there, the official reason was Coast Watchers, but they, it didn't cause them to change their routines or anything. They didn't react differently. Is that is that true? That is true. That is true to the extent they were they were already paranoid about the Coast Watchers. Yeah, yeah. And they were still going after the Coast Watchers. But when it came to their codes, when it came to their procedures, when it came to their treatment of top secret documents, even uh, within their headquarters, it didn't change anything. It, the Americans were uh, acting on New Georgia when they were on Bella Bella. Uh, they were repeatedly captured Japanese positions that had secret documents in them, secret plans, secret codes, secret uh, dispositions, identification of units. The Japanese would just leave them lying around because, you know, the Japanese could never lose this position to the Americans because you, you just don't defeat the Japanese. The, the Japanese mm -hmm. can't be defeated. They're supermen. So uh, there's no chance the Americans would get, get this information. And then there's just the certain lack of common sense, like the guy on the, the submarine I-1 uh, when it was uh, forced aground in sinking condition on Guadalcanal. He took, purportedly, he took the Japanese classified materials off the boat and he buried them ashore in enemy territory when he had the whole ocean in front of him and all of this paper that's face palm actually that's double face palm because you know where is the common sense here and this comes up again and again and again the, the japanese just think their stuff will never be captured that it can never be uh, used against them there was a case on new georgia where the americans captured some Japanese artillery pieces. The Japanese had, uh, it, was, it was off uh, Inoge, uh, and the Americans captured these artillery pieces. The Japanese had removed the breech blocks, so they couldn't be used. But with the ocean in front of them, they instead buried the, ble the breech blocks in the jungle where the Americans promptly dug them up when they were digging entrenchments. Hello? And this, this happened time and time and time again. In some ways, the, the Japanese, especially the Imperial Army, but also the Special Naval Landing Force troops, uh, they were just a complete lack of common sense, uh, inept on the attack. Now, on defense, they were brilliant. They were brilliant in terms of camouflage, in terms of their entrenchments, very difficult to find, very difficult to knock out. And uh, we learned a lot from them in terms of how to arrange defensive positions on attack and in how to treat classified information. Well, yeah, they, it, they left room for improvement, let's put it, put it that way. And then the next time we had a Coast Watcher issue in the Pacific War, was with respect to New Georgia itself. Because I mentioned Donald Kennedy earlier. He was the big coast watcher on New Georgia. And uh, he had his uh, plantation near Segi Point, which is at the southeastern end of the main island of New Georgia. There are so many New Georgia islands. It just gets confusing. And uh, he was a good good coast watcher and he had his own bodyguards he had his own little scouts but he also decided it would be cool to have his own little guerrilla war against the japanese and he had so many of these melanesian natives that he started doing this war a little bit and the japanese on new georgia now, I've said in the past, the Imperial Japanese Army was riddled with rapists, sadists, and thugs. 
and most of it was useless and inept when they faced anyone of even reasonable quality, with the exception of General Yamashita, who uh, defeated the British in Malaya and who gave us a pretty good fight in the Philippines. But they had a general in New Georgia named General, Sas uh, general Sasaki, and it's a little bit hard to gauge his ability. Uh, at the very least, he was competent, which was rare enough in the Imperial Army. And he noticed that any time he sent a patrol out into the Segi Point area, it disappeared. Like they weren't killed. There were no bodies found. They just vanished. They were just gone. Why is that? So he sent a rather competent major named Hera and a, a, a battalion of troops out there to figure out what was going on. And uh, Kennedy's people ambushed them a couple times, cost them a, you know, numerous troops. However, he soon found out that Hera had pinpointed where Kennedy's base was around Segi Point. And they were coming at him from three directions. This was actually a competently planned operation, a competently planned quasi-offensive operation, very rare for the Imperial Army. And Kennedy realized he was in over his head. He couldn't fight a real war against the Japanese. And so he called Wilder Canal and said, hey, uh, can you can you like sort of help me out here? A uh, little help, please. And uh, Guadalcanal decided, well, we're going to invade into Georgia anyway. So on about June 21st, they sent some Marine Raiders over to help secure Segi Point because we were going to build an air base there anyway. And we sent some reinforcements over the next couple days. And uh, New Georgia was what I would call a expected surprise. And I would compare it to like Kursk. The Battle of Kursk in the Soviet Union, uh, everyone knew the Germans were going to attack the salient around Kursk. Why the Germans still attacked it anyway, you have to ask Hitler that question. It was really stupid. Uh, everyone knew the Americans were going to land on Sicily at some point. And it was an expected surprise. And it occurred, both of those occurred at about the same time. And both of those occurred at about the same time we started the New Georgia campaign, Operation Toenails, which is really not one of the better code names they've used for these operations. The Japanese had found a, a great spot to build an air base on New Georgia near Munda Point. It is arguably uh, the best in the Solomon Islands. They would have been better off building it before the Guadalcanal campaign, but better late than never. And so they started building it before the Guadalcanal campaign was over. And we took to bombing it whenever we felt like it, you know, when in doubt, bomb Monday. And New Georgia is uh, exactly like Guadalcanal, only different. Uh, the uh, It's got more of a mountainous spine, a little bit more volcanic that way. You, see, you often see smoke coming from the craters there. The so soil is more coral in it and is harder. Uh, but the real problem with uh, New Georgia is that it is surrounded by reefs. It's very difficult to get to New Georgia because most ocean going ships can't negotiate the reefs. They keep running into things there. It's like their Convention and Visitors Bureau has, has a slogan, New Georgia, you can't get there from here. And you can't get there. We had a lot of problems figuring out how to get to New Georgia. But we knew we needed that air base. We couldn't let the Japanese have it and we couldn't let the Japanese keep New Georgia, and we couldn't go around it. We just had to take it. And we knew that. The Japanese knew that. This was another expected surprise. But there were some elements of it that, well, we tried to learn all the lessons we could about Guadalcanal. And so we didn't want to make those same mistakes again. So we made entirely new mistakes, mistakes that we had not made before. Uh, part of the New Georgia campaign that was brilliant, this Operation Tones that was brilliant, where the Japanese had uh, troops around 
like Viru, the harbor at Viru, which isn't really much of a harbor, and at Bairoko Point uh, on the north uh, western coast. But a lot of the troops were around the Munda Air Base. So if you go attack the Munda Air Base, you go land there, you're going to have to fight your way ashore. General Vandergrift in Guadalcanal was of the opinion, hit them where they ain't, which is the old baseball slogan, and it makes sense. Uh, and so the Americans were determined to not hit them where they ain't, to hit them where they ain't, rather. And so instead of landing on New Georgia proper with the big landing, we landed on Rendova, which was that that big island to the south. And it's within artillery reach of the Munda airfield. The Japanese had guarded everything except Rendova. They had like 100 troops there. And they all ran when we landed. Like those special naval landing force troops, they never surrender. They got they keep that reputation by running into the jungle when they meet serious opposition. So we took Randova fairly quickly, and General Sasaki was like, uh, this is not going well. And so we landed there, we got all of our all of our supplies there. It was an absolutely brilliant move, a brilliant place to land. And uh the rest of the landing, well, it was not necessary. We landed at like five points on New Georgia. You heard of concentration of force, economy of force. Why are we landing at five points on New Georgia? We had to land at so many points, we couldn't even land at them at the same time. Seggy Point, you can understand that because we wanted to build an airfield there and our Coast Watcher there was in trouble. And we didn't have to commit too much in the way of resources there. We tried to land at Viru Harbor which again, not really much of a harbor, not much value in it. We landed at the Wickham Anchorage because we wanted to use it as a PT boat base. Now, when you have limited forces with which to conduct this landing, with which to conduct the high value ca campaign for the air base at Munda, why would you send some of them to capture a potential PT boat base? It, 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 Admiral Turner was the one who put this campaign together, <clears throat> and as a general, he was a very good admiral. The other one, the fifth one that was had several days later, was uh, at uh, Inoge uh, Rice Anchorage on the northwest coast. But those were, and, and that was questionable. I mean, that, that was justifiable, but I still don't think, in my personal opinion, sitting, you know, 80 years from the events described herein, uh, that it was really worth taking away from the main landing at uh, Randova, which ultimately went over to New Georgia in the area of the uh, Munda airfield. And this was all started because Donald Kennedy got in over his head as a coast watcher and turned it into a guerrilla campaign against the Japanese. Might be overstating it just a little bit because we we're going to go after New Georgia anyway, but the campaign was kicked off by the landing at Seggy Point to help Donald Kennedy. So that's that's how the campaign started. Uh, the next couple days, we were bringing reinforcements in. Like when we had the Inogay landing, uh, we had an incident where the destroyer Strong took a torpedo that blew out her keel it was so powerful it just blew straight through the ship and uh she started rolling over and then one of our destroyers trying to help her the chevalier she promptly ran into the strong and she had to run into the strong because she was about to be run into herself by the destroyer o'bannon this is a theme that comes back because the Destroyer O'Bannon would run into the destroyer Chevalier again. Now, it's strange enough for a, for a ship to be involved in one collision. To be involved in two collisions is almost astronomical. But two collisions with the same ship, you know, that's, a, that's a record of some sort. I mean, that should be written down somewhere. They couldn't figure out where this torpedo that, that ultimately sank the strong came from. They didn't see any ships around. They hadn't seen any submarines. Where did that come from? And this is where we start what I called the Parthian shots. Parthian shots is a reference to Marcus Crassus. Uh, 
where he invaded Parthia, a country known for its horse archers with heavy infantry. The horse archers would run away from the heavy infantry and turn around and then shoot the arrows at them with deadly accuracy, and they were called Parthian shots. And this is something that happened repeatedly in uh, at the end of the Guadalcanal campaign and in the middle of the Solomon's campaign. Shoratessa Faranga. Here's the pattern. The Japanese come in with supplies for their troops, on generally on destroyers. They may have a cruiser escort, but it's generally on destroyers. We send in ships, generally cruisers, to intercept them. The Japanese ships flee. In the process, they launch torpedoes. We chase after the Japanese with our cruisers, blundering into the torpedoes. This happened at the Battle of Tassafaranga. This actually happened on the previous slide because the torpedo that struck the strong was fired by fleeing Japanese in a Parthian shot. This happened at the first Battle of Kula Gulf, which is what this, this slide is showing. Uh, Japanese doing a reinforcement con operation, Americans show up with cruisers, they target the main Japanese ship, the largest Japanese ship with their radar, they pound it into scrap within the first few minutes, then couldn't hit water if they fell from a boat for the rest of the battle. This was, a, again, a pattern. Japanese started fleeing, fired torpedoes, and uh, we lost the cruiser Helena to those torpedoes. And I would call the attention to the, the photo of the bow of the Helena, uh, it's from Samuel Elliott Morrison's book, Breaking the Bismarck's Barrier. And uh, it is really, that's the only photo of its kind that I've ever seen. And I'm just fast, I've always been fascinated by it. Uh, just because it, the bow, it is said, it, it popped up once the ship had sunk. And it returned to the surface and was a source of comfort for the survivors in the water. It's just sort of an eerie shot, but I always was fascinated by it. And roughly the same thing happened again at the second Battle of Kula Gulf or the third Battle of Kula Gulf, depending on what you're counting. Again, the main Japanese ship was sunk. The Admiral killed. Japanese start fleeing. They fire torpedoes. They hit one cruiser, the Kiwi cruiser Leander. Uh, then they go to reload their torpedoes. And we chase after them with our cruisers. They fire torpedoes again. So they do two Parthian shots in the same battle, and they hit both U.S. cruisers, the St. Louis and the Honolulu. This, And I don't know that we ever picked up on this pattern. We started picking up that we're losing cruisers, so maybe we shouldn't you know, commit them. And uh, in the Solomons, at least. And as it was at this point where we start realizing what the, that the land campaign is in trouble in New Georgia because of uh, what is essentially a nervous breakdown by the 43rd Infantry Division, which was the main division uh, committed to the campaign, to, to committed to the landing. We had jumped over uh, the uh, Roviana Lagoon to the mainland of New Georgia with the 43rd Division. But the 43rd Division was, it was untested. It was trained in jungle warfare and it was trained in warfare in general, but sending this untested division into jungle warfare to adjust to them both at the same time, that was a little bit more than it could handle. And if you remember on Guadalcanal, we sent the 1st Marine Division there. They had a few weeks before their major combat where they could at least adjust to the uh, jungle because the Guadalcanal jungle the Solomon's jungle is different than the jungle in which they were trained. That was the same thing with the 43rd Division. And combat is different from training. You let your instincts take over. You let your training take over as much as you can. But it is still different. It has a different feel to it. You have a different reaction to it. And the 43rd Division, instead of getting, you know, having to adjust to them one after the other, it had to adjust to them at the same time. And it had sort of a collective nervous breakdown and I've included some photos here of what were uh, some from the First World War of what some called shell shock. It was later called combat stress reaction. Uh, and the 43rd Division seemed to be having this. The Japanese would walk up to their uh, bivouac at night. 
the 43rd had not set up effective uh, perimeters or scouts, and the Japanese would start taunting them. And the troops would just start shooting often at each other at, in the other foxholes. And they they weren't getting any sleep. Uh, the the division kind of went, went in there, and the, ultimately the corps commander went in there and um, said, yeah, we're having some problems here. We not, might need to get these guys some help. We might need to commit some more troops. We might need to get them better medical care. Uh, we might need to, you know, better train the troops in the future for how to handle this, you know, what sounds to expect in the jungle, for instance. And so the 43rd got some help. We had to do an, another landing. And uh, this is going backwards. And so ultimately, uh, with those reinforcements, we had to push again. And there was a, a really serious Japanese counterattack that nearly drove us into the water. Seriously, we had an open flank and the Japanese went around uh, in the into the jungle and attacked us, not with their normal banzai charge, because Sasaki was, seems to have been too smart for that. They just sort of, I mean, they were yelling banzai, but they're sort of going in there in small groups. And they went after the divisional command post and went after the communications cables for the artillery. And it was only because of that artillery and some major efforts uh, that that counterattack was beaten back, and that really broke the back of the Japanese on uh, in terms of Munda. But there was more to that campaign uh, than that. Um, it was the start of island hopping, and uh, this was another story of Coast Watchers. I'll just get to this one real quick. Uh, about 160 survivors of the Helena, I mentioned that earlier, they had uh, survived the sinking and they just drifted up the, the uh, Solomon Islands chain and they made their way to Bella La Bella. And they were helped ashore by some of the natives and the natives told uh, Henry Jocelyn, who was the main coast watcher there. And some, some more of the survivors also got around the Reverend Sylvester. And uh, they were able to get mostly in respect to health on Bella La Bella, uh, but they couldn't stay there because the natives didn't have enough food for them for one thing. and. They kind of stood out among the natives on Bella Bella because they didn't really tan as much as the natives did. And so uh, once their uh, identities were confirmed, uh, the U.S. Navy, uh, U.S. military makes a point of trying to rescue its people, trying to rescue its uh, prisoner, its people. It doesn't want to leave anybody behind except in Afghanistan. <clears throat> and uh, so they made a major operation using two high-speed tra destroyer transports and a major destroyer escort to go to Bella La Vela and recover these 165 uh, survivors of the USS Helena. And it was a major operation. They had to distract the Japanese and everything, but it was successful and it was done because of the work of Henry Jocelyn and, and the Reverend Sylvester. So that's, and, and Bella La Vela, was ultimately where we did what I call the hop because the Japanese, when they were withdrawing from Munda, they had 15,000 troops on Kolom Bangara. And uh, well, we didn't want to fight 15,000 troops. So we decided let's go to Vela La Vela instead. They don't have as many troops on Vela La Vela. In fact, they had like only a few hundred. And so we landed there and threatened to cut off their troops. And that's on uh, Colum Bangara in the middle of it. And that, that sort of started the next phase of the campaign. Uh, by that time, we had already had our really first major victory against the Japanese. It was a total victory when we finally used the Japanese tactics against them. Fire torpedoes first from camouflage, hiding, using the darkness of an island as a backdrop. You can't see us. Not like the you know, minarets you can see behind me right now, the Hagia Sophia. And the Japanese weren't expecting us to use their own tactics against them. Go figure. Lack of imagination. We sank three or four destroyers. The Japanese were actually horrified by uh, the Battle of Villa Gulf in this particular operation right here. And this was uh, designed by the, uh, the guy I mentioned earlier, Arlie Burke. And with that... The start of the Bella La Vella campaign started. This is why I started talking about it probably a little bit too soon. And uh, then the Japanese had to figure out how to get their people off of 
Colum Bangara, and they came up with the brilliant idea of using barges. They would send barges over to uh, pass through a little barge base they had on Horaniu, on uh, Vela La Vela, and go through Choice Hill, go through other places, and get to uh, Colum Bangara, take their troops off, and then go through the whole shindig again back to the short lands. And then this was the last battle, this one of the uh, New Georgia campaign, this battle of El La Vela, where the Japanese were trying to withdraw their barge troops, uh, who had set up the barge lanes. And uh, it was really sort of a, a strange battle where our destroyers really had problems dealing with barges. And they complained left and right about the Japanese barges. It's like our, dest our destroyers armed with five inch guns, 20 millimeter uh, anti aircraft guns, 50, uh, uh, 50 caliber machine guns. We couldn't handle barges. They could not handle barges. The Japanese just, they were mistaken with the carry striking force, Kido Butai. They were mistaken with the Yamato at the Type 93 Long Lance Torpedo Zero. They shouldn't have focused on that stuff. They should have just sent. Barges. A whole mess of barges could have taken Midway. A whole mess of barges could have just taken the West Coast because we can't handle barges. Don't tell Vladimir Putin about them because then we'd be in big trouble. Yeah, it's ridiculous that they could. I I got the impression that the destroyers just didn't really want to deal with the barges. But um, this was sort of a, a sort of bizarre battle in which for the first time we didn't have the advantage, but we charged anyway which was another Japanese tactic. With the Japanese destroyers, they, they knew their torpedoes, they trusted their torpedoes, and so they were fearless in battle. And uh, they would, while they would flee, like I just described earlier, they would attack. They would make sure they fired their torpedoes first. And we decided we were outnumbered nine to three in this attack. We wouldn't wait for reinforcements. We just went in there anyway, which was a growing confidence in of U.S. Navy sailors, U.S. Navy officers in ourselves, in our crews, in our training, in our ships, in our equipment. And the battle, it was a sort of, it was a strategic loss because the Japanese barges got through. Right. Uh, we just exchanged a destroyer for a destroyer. But uh, it was a sign of the new aggressiveness of the U.S. Navy, of the Pacific Fleet that was now coming to the fore in the Pacific. And uh, that's... That's pretty much it. Well, as usual, fantastic. But we've got plenty of time for questions, so uh, um, we'll we'll do that in a minute. And uh, uh, but yeah, fantastic stuff. So obviously, the, your your plans for the book it's the third volume. You've got plans for a fourth at some point. Um, where where what will you do next? I mean, while we're waiting for some questions, will you move to to the later in the war, or back earlier in the war? Will you just give up and do something else? What are your long term plans? Well, I'm I'm going in a bit two directions at once. I'm also looking at some projects from the Pacific War as well, but uh, I've also been working on ancient Rome. In fact, the uh, the photo you see behind me of yeah, I'm just having trouble dealing with this whole you know mirror thing of Istanbul. That was from my trip to uh, Turkey and Greece last summer when I was researching a book on the Battle of Adrianople from AD 378. Uh, when the Romans and the Emperor Valens were defeated by a confederation of Goths. And uh, I was going to potential battlefields in the area of the Turkish city of Adirne and trying to determine, you know, what was the most likely a spot for the battle to have taken place and was it possible to have taken place mm -hmm. in the way that many of us believe it did. Uh, and so I've got some of those things uh, in the fire at the moment, but I've still got several Pacific projects going also so some of it's just i've done this i've read this stuff since i was a kid and a lot of it's just you know coming out with what i've studied for so long and oh, I, get, I guess you get to the point where you've collated so much information to research the earlier books you might as well carry on using the information to kind of cull more books from it and carry on the work because it's the as we always say it's the research work that takes the time it's the accessing of the archives and cross-checking everything Kind of once you've got that in place, I suppose some people find the writing process process easier. I don't myself. Anyway, we've got a question coming up, uh, which is about anti-aircraft differences. A mad cat is asking, 
in this kind of period of the war, so 1943, American anti-aircraft defense is better than Japanese on their ships or Japanese better than American? Ours were better. We not only had better guns um, with the 20 millimeter Ehrlichans and the uh, 40 millimeter Bofors, which, you, which we manufactured under license, uh, but we had better anti-aircraft tactics. Remember, early in the war, uh, especially what I call the Battle of the Flores Sea and what others call the Battle of the Flores Sea, the idea, uh, and that was during the Java Sea campaign, the idea was for the ships to scatter. So when you have a task force, a task force like this, try this, they would scatter so that the aircraft attacking, well, they'd have to split themselves up to attack all the different elements of this. Well, that's, you know, what if the aircraft all decide to attack one and not the other ones? Well, that ship would be in big trouble. So the Americans took to both increasing the armament and the uh, quality of the armament on their carriers and the battleships. I mean, the, the battleship South Dakota at the Battle of the Santa Cruz Islands, she was described as a volcano with what she sent up. And she uh, she and the Enterprise and some of the anti-aircraft cruisers like the San Juan were credited with single-handedly destroying what was left of Kido Butai's flyers at that point. Uh, but we unify everything. We bring the ships closer together. They have less room to maneuver, but we mass our aircraft or any aircraft fire together. And so to attack any one of the ships, the Japanese are going to have to go through this big mass of any aircraft fire. And, and it's, it, it's something borrowed from aerial tactics where bombers like B-17s or B-24s were turning from an attack. If Japanese fighters are going after them, they would mass together so that they could maximize their anti-aircraft fire and cover each other. But we didn't do that for ships at the beginning of the war. It took the floor is sea action really to teach us that we needed to mass our ships together and ultimately to get better uh, anti-aircraft armament with the Ehrlichans and the Bofors. The Japanese, it took them a long time to learn that same lesson. And I'm not sure they ever really did because I'm still reading at this point in the war, they're still scattering to try to uh, deal with an air attack. They, they want to be able to maneuver the ships to avoid the bombs and avoid the torpedoes. They're not thinking of you know trying to shoot down the aircraft before they get there. Okay, thank you. Um, this is from uh, Alan Burt. Do you feel the quality of ships and training stroke experience or confidence was a real change in the period of 1943 onwards? It was a changer in terms of we had people with the war experience. We at the beginning of the war, we had the bureaucratic admirals, the bureaucratic officers who had risen using bureaucratic means. They were put in a war situation for which many of them were not suited. Uh, at this point in the war, now you have people who have been through the war, who have risen through the ranks during the war, who have fought, who have the chops to fight. And they are starting to come to the forefront and people who are creative coming to the forefront and they're starting to assert themselves. It was also, and uh, this, this needs to be mentioned also, the Japanese were declining in their quality, the quality mm -hmm. of not just their pilots, which which was pretty famous at this point. Uh, but the quality of their seamanship, too. They're making some pretty serious mistakes in terms of how they handled ships, how they handled their, their weaponry, how they handled damage control. Uh, it was just a, a major decline from what it had been just a year before. That's a good point. And we've talked about it with yourself and John McManus is that there's that period in 42, 43, and this would apply to the East uh, ETO as well as the Pacific and probably the Eastern Front as well, where both sides are are fairly level pegging. But then once the, the, uh, the, the, the split occurs, as the allies get better, the axis also declines. So the gap between the two uh, elements gets gets wider and wider as the war goes on. We've got a question from Gary Giamara who's saying, I know at Casablanca a lot of LSTs and amphibious craft were allocated to the Pacific. Do you have an idea of how many LSTs or LCTs ended up in the South Pacific or were used in Operation Toenails? The, the vast majority of them, the vast majority of them were allocated to the European theater uh, for not just uh, Operation Torch, but for Operation Husky and ultimately for D-Day. Uh, the Pacific 
got what was left over. And that was a policy decision uh, at the highest reaches. And don't get me wrong, that was a justified policy decision to make Germany first. Germany was the existential mm -hmm. threat much more than Japan was. Now, the way they handled it, especially on the part of General Arnold, uh, who wanted to, I said that, you know, he wanted to starve the Pacific of everything and let the Japanese occupy everything up to and including the Rocky Mountains uh, before he would assign one more plane to the Pacific theater. Uh, he was a bit unreasonable about it, uh, but everything, w it was a fight to get things for the Pacific War. Mm -hmm. uh, the LST, and there were so many LST, there were differences in LSTs, uh, LCTs, uh, and they were and they were numbered and in, in, in sort of strange things. Mostly, I would say it was in the dozens for the uh, right uh, for the uh, New Georgia campaign. But it, again, it goes by some of the definitions. Like some things that you might call a, a landing ship might be just more of a boat or something. And it, it just it's a little bit of a issue with semantics. Okay. This one is potentially a bit of a rabbit hole, but it is how would Jeff evaluate the combat leadership of Admiral Merrill and Admiral Ainsworth? Admiral Merrill was good. He would uh, take a look at previous battles to see what had worked and what had not worked. And he was willing to admit that what we did, what our doctrine was, was not the best and needed some changes. He was not quite as radical as uh, Arlie Burke would prove to be later on. Arlie Burke was worked closely with Admiral Merrill. But he was the one who created an atmosphere for Arlie Burke where he could flourish where he could make his uh, tactical determinations policy, part of doctrine. Ainsworth was a step below that, but I don't think it was necessarily a lack of talent, a lack of ability on Ainsworth's part so much as he was restricted by his doctrine and he wasn't as willing as Admiral Merrill to go outside that doctrine. I mean, he was the one at Kula Gulf and Kolombangara who ran into the Japanese trap essentially three times. Twice at the second Kula at, at Kolombangara, once at the at Battle of Kula Gulf, and it also happened with him with the sinking of the destroyer strong. He was constrained because he didn't realize that the Japanese torpedoes were so good. And that they had such a long range. And that's one reason he ran into those traps was because he didn't know about the range. He didn't know about the reloads. But he also didn't stop to consider some of the possibilities <clears throat> as he was going into these battles. Uh, so and and he didn't consider them because, you know, our doctrine wouldn't allow to. We were, we were in the big guns. We had these cruisers with 15, 16 inch guns. They could fire like machine guns. We had this great fire control radar. It ended up not being as great as we thought it was because it had some issues. We didn't know quite how to translate it. Uh, he would think we sank six ships when we sank only one. But that was, again, because of the radar and because of the doctrine he was using. So <clears throat> I wouldn't criticize Ainsworth on the basis of his ability. I would criticize uh, that the doctrine under which he was operating uh, very limited him. Merrill was much w more willing to question that doctrine and go outside of it. Great response. And it, and it brings up that wider question of which is more influential or more of a problem, doctrine or commanders. In the, if a commander is, is constrained by the doctrine or the doctrine is constrained by a commander, there's, there's, a, there's a disconnect there. But that's a big potential subject for other day. We've got one final one. Sean Brennan is just asking, just back to the barges thing. Uh, you say Jeff's have plate armor, but why were U.S. weapons ineffective against them? Sorry if he missed that in the show. Well, the destroyer commanders would complain uh, that the barges, and let's say what we're talking about here, they're talking about like, you know, they could be 50, you know, 50 feet long. They could, you know, hold 100 people, whatever. They could be metal. They could be wood. They be, could move at about 10 knots. 
uh, they were not really ocean capable, but they were designed in such a way that it was hard to tell whether they were which direction they were moving in. The destroyer commanders would complain that uh, they couldn't move any slower than 20 knots because of the destroyers could move any slower than 20 knots because out of fear of submarines and uh, other Japanese ships that could launch torpedoes at them. So they had to go fast, which meant they would pass by these barges fast. The barges would get lost in radar contacts among radar, among the splashes, which would show up on radar. And you would think you would sunk a barge. And they're talking mostly at night because that's when they'd have to deal with the barges. Uh, th they would have trouble telling when or if they had sunk a barge. They would think they had sunk it when uh, a few minutes later the barge would show up again. And it wasn't just one barge. They were talking about masses of barges. And these masses of barges would scatter. So it was very difficult to hunt them all down. And the Japanese were very good at moving them uh, into hiding spots along the coast. But what it came down to, uh, and I'm, I'm saying this, to, you know, to answer the question, to be fair to the destroyer commanders, they said that, you know, they were having trouble with uh, telling where they could track down the barges on radar, whether they had sunk the barge on radar because the returns were so inconsistent uh, and were mixed up with the shell splashes and uh, that the PT boats that were sometimes sent against the barges. Well, they started a, a uh, arms race between PT boats and barges and the PT boats had to lose their torpedo tubes for 40 millimeter cannons, which is what MacArthur's PT boats used and they were effective against barges. Uh, but the destroyers, uh, they should have been more effective in my opinion. Okay, well, thank you. We'll we'll leave it there. Uh, people have got more questions, but we'll save them for when you're you're back again in the future. Uh, there's the books there. I say I've got a copy of your book. You haven't. Uh, it's out for pre-order. That comes out on my birthday, which is rather cool. I don't know whether there's any connection there. But Jeff, it's been great talking to you. Uh, good luck with the book, and I will send out an invitation to invite you back again. We can carry on at some point later in the year. But it's as usual. It's been great talking to you. So thanks very much. Oh, thank you. Always a pleasure. Cheers then, everybody. See you all again tomorrow with another show with Trent Tomenko. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your views. See you again later. Bye.